so I'm, I've titled the presentation, How to Know If You're a True Christian. How to Know If You're a True Christian. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. Baptize us anew with power from on high. And let your word speak. Let your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How to know if you're a true Christian. You know, I mentioned last evening that this matter of spiritual growth is demonstrated in the lives of some individuals that God worked with. With Abraham, with the children of Israel, and with the apostles. And you're going to find that growth gives evidence in different aspects of their lives. But the primary primary area of growth is in your behavior. It's in your behavior, in your character, how you live, the things you do. Even though you can do things to become Christian, in the sense that you, you, you try to do good to become mature Christians, but evidence of maturity is demonstrated in how you behave, you know. Um, Persons have often measure their maturity by how often they go to church. Some persons will measure you based upon how you dress. Some persons will measure you based upon how involved you are in church. You know, church activities and stuff like that. Some persons will measure their maturity by how long they spend in prayer. But this evening, we're going to present the biblical principle of spiritual growth, what the Bible teaches on how we should measure spiritual maturity. And based upon what the Bible teaches, there are three areas of our lives by which maturity is measured. Our Christian maturity is demonstrated, as I said, in how we behave or our character. And the, the measuring stick for character development are the principles of love found in the, in the Ten Commandments and in the Word of God. Our character, our, our maturity is also measured by our faith, the exercise of our faith. And we can see that in the experience of the children of Israel, that what God was teach, trying to teach them is how to have faith in Him. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. We're going to talk about how to grow in faith. And the third area is maturity in doctrine, that maturity in understanding, because Paul says that the mature Christian will no longer be children being tossed to and fro in their minds about what they know about the truth. But tonight, we're talking about maturity in love. Maturity in love. I want to remind us, brothers and sisters, that the reason we are talking about growth, the reason we are talking about spiritual maturity and, and growth is because we have fallen into sin. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and as, as a result, this world has been plunged into darkness and evil, and every child of Adam is born with a sinful nature. We discussed that last evening. And so when we are saved, when we are called to come to Christ and to be restored, we are being restored into the image of God. And, and sometimes, I'm telling you this, sometimes as Christians we can forget, we can, we can forget this, uh, so I have to remind you, the goal of our character development is to become mature in love, to become mature in the practice of the principles of love. That is the goal of our Christian life. I mean, we can get sidetracked as to what our goal is, as I mentioned earlier. We can, we can use Bible study and prayer as a measuring stick for our 
or, or a maturity. But brothers and sisters, <laughs> you're going to find that some of the most evil Christians can be those who spend, who, who quote scripture. <laughs> some of the most evil script, Christians are those who preach scripture. And so, you know, so you wonder what is, how do I know if I'm a true Christian? That's what I've been talking about tonight. You see, love has its origin with God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, the Bible tells us that God is love, and whoever does not love is not of God. Love is God's modus operandi. It is, it is a principle by which he operates, and he calls us to operate by those same principles. Principles of unselfish love. When we are born again, as I mentioned last evening, and we receive the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the Holy Spirit come to recreate and to reproduce and to shed abroad the love of God in our heart. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, And hope make it not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the Holy Spirit is given unto us to reproduce or to produce the fruit of the Spirit, the, Bible, the Apostle Paul referred to it as. And that's why our maturity is measured by the principles of love. When Jesus says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he's talking about the principles of love. How do I know that? Because in the same passage, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, before he says they must be perfect, he says, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. Jesus says, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he explained that what this means is that we must have the principles of God's law written in our hearts. And that's why he started out the Sermon on the Mount as he did by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. These are the people who can truly have the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. These are the light of the world. These are the salt of the earth. These are the children of the Heavenly Father. These are the ones who can truly love their enemies. And Jesus says, by this, by this, John 13, verse 35, sorry, by this shall all men know <laughs> that you are my disciples. When you have love one for the other. When you have love one for the other. That is how you know. That is how you know that you are my disciple. So if you want to know if you are a true Christian, examine yourselves by the principles of love found in the word of God. This love is described in the King James Version as charity, unconditional love. And if you notice, in the Apostle Peter's ladder of Christian progress that we discussed last evening, you'll notice, brothers and sisters, Peter says, starting with faith, you must add virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Because charity is the capstone of the Christian's character development progress. And so as you measure your growth, brothers and sisters, yes, measure it by how much faith you have. Yes, 
Measure it by how much knowledge you have of Christ. Yes, measure it by self-control. Yes, measure it by how much patience you have. Measure it by godliness and godlikeness. Measure it by brotherly kindness. But know that in the end, if you don't have love, all of that is vanity. You don't believe me? Check what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. The Apostle Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gun and a clanging cymbal. You know, I, <laughs> I did some research into what the apostle means by a resounding gun or a clanging cymbal, and I, and I did some research on YouTube. And when I, when, I, when I listened to what the apostle Paul was saying, it's a noise <laughs> in my head. My head couldn't take it. It's a noisy fix something. Noisy, but no, no, no purpose. You know, I mean, when you, when you have a, a group singing well, you know, it can be loud and you'll endure it. But when you have something making noise and it doesn't make any sense, it gives you a headache. Paul is saying if you claim to be a Christian and you have that love, you're only making noise that is useless noise. Paul says, if I have the gift of prophecy, <laughs> if I have the gift of prophecy, if I know the book of Daniel and Revelation from cover to cover, and I don't have love, I am not a true Christian. Because many of us judge our Christianity based upon how much prophecy we know. And I know, don't get me wrong, we need to know prophecy. We need to understand prophecy. We're going to talk about that um, on Wednesday night. But Paul is saying, it's not me saying it. Paul is saying, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, and if I have faith that I can remove mountains and have not love, Paul says, I gain nothing. I gain absolutely nothing. You know, I, I, I know what this is like. I know when I devoted my life to Christ as a young man and, and started to walk with him and to study his word and to try to understand what is the, you know, you, you feel that, you know, Bible reading and prayer should be the standard and you, you make sure you have your devotion every day and you, you try to go to church and, and do the Lord's work. But I came to the realization of this Im the importance of having focus and purpose in our character development. When I faced one of the most, one of the greatest tragedy in my experience as a Christian, you know, church people can hurt you. Bridget. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the persons who are closest to you can hurt you the most. By the way, if you, if you weren't aware of that, and church people can be this instrument in the hand of the devil to hurt you. And I remember, I remember my own experience of being hurt by the church and, 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 and I realized that after all the years of serving the Lord, hatred was taking over my heart. And I said, I said God, it's not right. <laughs> if yeah, I've been serving you, I, that, that, that can't work. And I pray, I remember I prayed, I said, God, help me. And I realized, I realized that in the end, what God was trying to teach me is that if you, if you serve him in ministry, if you, if you carry out all the duties faithfully, if you read your Bible and pray, and you don't come face to face with what love is, then like what the Apostle Paul is saying, your Christianity is in vain. Because I remember I said it, some time ago, when I just started in the church and started reading the Bible, I was shocked because I was saying, how come it is in the Bible that you should love your enemies and yet people are in the church keeping malice? 
how come it is in the Bible that you should do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. And yet people in the church are still keeping malice with each other and taking each other to court. Paul says, if you claim to be a Christian and you're not practicing the principles of love, your Christianity is in vain. And it is my desire, brothers and sisters, that as a church, I'm calling to my the Seventh-day Adventist church, it is my desire that while we pro proclaim the Sabbath and the commandment, which is very good, that people will know us for how much we love each other, for how much we care for each other. And, 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 and if you think that Paul was just talking about love or, or just saying the, lo the word love, Paul gave us a definition of that love. In verse 4, starting from verse 4, he says, Charity suffer it long and is kind. Charity envy it not. Charity vaunt it not itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. Seek it not her own and is not easily provoked. Think it no evil. I'm going to take my time to break down each of these definition that the Apostle Paul gave it. The Apostle Paul says, charity suffer it long. Charity is long-suffering. It's from the Greek word makrothumeo, which means to, to, to be long-suffering as opposed to be, to be hasty to be punished. You must not be in haste to punish. And this word, my brother and sisters, this word is used by Jesus in his parable of the man who was forgiven of his debt. You see, the Bible tells us about, Jesus told us about a parable, a man who owed the king 10,000 talents, but he couldn't pay it. And when he begged, the, 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 the king called him in and said, listen, pay your debt, I'm going to put you in prison. And the man said, Marcus Mayo. He called the king and said, have patience with me. Have mercy upon me. L suffer long with me. And the king said, okay, I, for I forgive your debt. I cancel your debt. And he went. But this same man who was forgiven 10,000 talents found a man who owed him 10 pence. And he held the man by the throat and said, pay me. And the man said to him, Marcus Mayo, have patience with me. And the man who was forgiven 10,000 talents could not have mercy upon the man who owed him 10 pence. And you know what the Lord, you know what happened? The news went back to the king and the king decided that he's going to, he said, listen, I, oh, I, I saved you from prison because you owed me 10,000 and you couldn't pardon this man. And Jesus says, this is the same thing that the Father will do to you if you do not from your heart forgive your brother. Because sometimes we give the impression that people have done us so much wrong that we have a right not to forgive them. We are justified in our effort to make them pay. <laughs> and we, we forgot, we forget that the Lord have mercy upon us. We couldn't pay our debt. We couldn't pay our debt of sin if we had to pay for it. And Jesus pardoned us. And Jesus is saying that since God forgive you, then forgive your brother. <laughs> and, and, and if you want to claim that the sin is too great for you to forgive your brother, Think about how much God has forgiven you. You know, when, 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 when Peter asks Jesus, how often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Peter put a number on it. Peter said, till seven times seven. Because, I mean, Peter was saying, I mean, that's a lot. Seven times. Jesus said, no, it is 70 times seven. <laughs> You know what Jesus was doing? 
Jesus was actually saying, this is how much God is willing to forgive you. It wasn't just about how much we should forgive. It was about how much God is willing to forgive. And God is saying, there is no excuse. There is absolutely no excuse. So Paul says, love suffers long. It was Ellen White who said that love does not only bear with each other's faults, but love is willing to endure whatever inconvenience that comes with enduring. You know, this society is teaching us how to be very selfish and to cut off people and to avoid people. But Jesus is saying something different. We should love each other. Paul also says that love is kind. Love is kind. And this kindness is not just referring to giving out money, you know, when people ask us for things, we are willing to give them. Yes, that is important because Paul says that even if you give your body to be burnt and have that love, so it means that this kindness is referring to something more than just willingness to give of your means. This kindness referred to an attitude of being gracious towards people, of being thoughtful towards people, of thinking more about the needs of others than yourself. Kindness. It was George Knight who said, that normal people give others what they deserve, but God give them what they need. So your enemies, and, and by the way, let me just clarify, when, I say, when the Bible says love your enemies, your enemies are not those who you, who you hate. <laughs> let me just clarify that. Your enemies are not those who you hate because the Christian have no right to hate people. Your enemies are those who hate you. A big difference. So kindness is saying that your enemies deserve bad treatment. But what they need is love. What they need is patience. What they need is long-suffering. So it is kindness that leads us to love our enemies. To bless them that curse us and to do good to them that hate us and pray for them that the people use and persecute us. It is the kindness of God that led him to have mercy upon us and to give his son a sacrifice for sin. And then the Bible says, love envy it not. You see, I must remind you that the context in which the Apostle Paul spoke these words was he spoke these words to a church in Corinth who was severely divided over giftedness. The church in Corinth was divided over who had the greatest gift and who deserved the attention and who deserved to be noticed. And Paul is saying to the Corinthian brethren, brethren, if you truly had love in your heart, you should have not been disunited. If you had love in your heart, you would have been united. Because love envy it not. What is envy it not? This refers to the idea of being jealous. Love is not jealous. And when I, when I talk about jealous, I'm not talking about the, the, the godly jealousy that God has towards us. This is not talking about a zeal for others. Listen to this very carefully now. This, this type of jealousy is one where not only do you like what other people have, but you, you don't like the idea that they have it. <laughs> You, you didn't get me there. You know, so, so, so you, 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 
you not only admire that 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 pastor can sing better than you, but you in your heart you say, boy, I wish pastor never couldn't couldn't sing like that. It is bad mind and covetous and jealous. Paul says, love envy it not. In the sense that if somebody has something that I don't have, I am cool with that. I can rejoice in the success of others. This is what the apostles did not have before Pentecost. They were jealous of each other. And so they were always competing with each other. They were always striving to see who would be first. And that is evidence that there is not love in the camp. And that's why James asked the question, where does war and fighting come from among you? This come not from above, it come from beneath. The spirit of envy and strife is from the devil. Paul says, love, envy it not. If somebody can sing better than me, if somebody can speak in tongues, and I can't speak in tongues, it is all right. I am cool with that because love envy it not. And then he says, love is not puffed up. Love does not parade itself. It does not exult in the things one has. In other words, if you have more than others, you're not going to parade it to cause them to, to feel jealous or to make them look small. Love is not puffed up. It's not proud. Love, brothers and sisters, does not behave rudely. I could, I could go through the entire list, but time will not allow me, but I hope you get the point, brothers and sisters. That Paul is getting to the root of the matter. <laughs> this is similar to what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Pharisees had a religion that was not of the heart. The Pharisees had a religion that was based on outward show. They dressed well every day and were in the temple and they would pray long prayers in the street. And they would give alms so that everybody could see. Jesus says, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the, the, the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven because the character that God is looking for is from the heart. And he, continue, he says, you have heard it said, you must, you must not kill. But I say unto you, that if you hate your brother in the heart, you are guilty of murder. That's what Jesus meant when he says that you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's referring to the character of the Father that holds the principles of love, my brothers and sisters. So as you measure your growth, as you measure your growth, if you want to know if you're a true Christian, measure it by the principles of love. I could go on and on. There are so many other verses, but I want to close with this one. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, no, it's not God, for God is love. We can come up with, with, with so many reasons. We can come up with so many reasons why we shouldn't love so and so. But let me ask you a question. How much reasons can God come up with as to why he should love us? <laughs> how, much, how, much, how much reasons can God come up with? They are countless. But he says we must love one another. Even notice that the Holy Spirit did not come at Pe Pentecost until the disciples were together in one accord. And then anyway, it says that when they got into that upper room, they realized that they needed each other. 
they realize that rather than competing with each other, they should be united. And they should love each other despite the mistakes and shortcomings that they cannot but see. And this is the principle of love. As you, as you, as you work to grow in love, you're going to find there are some key things that you need to overcome by the grace of God. Found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. You need to overcome pride. The pride of life. The pride of life, brothers and sisters, is a principle of worldliness. The pride of life says that I must always look good in the eyes of others. The pride of life strives and hungers for affirmation from others and always wanting to appear good in the eyes of others. Pride of life is very expensive because it leads us to be dishonest, to maintain that status. We must overcome selfishness. Selfishness is deeply ingrained in our hearts. And even after we are converted, if we, are, if we don't submit to the Spirit of Christ, we'll revert to that selfishness. We must overcome the love of this world, the love of supremacy, the love of fame and popularity. We have to overcome those things for the love of God to take root in our hearts. This precious gem, this precious boon of heaven, Ellen White says, doesn't come by our own effort. Love in the heart of the sinner or of the believer is a miracle from God. It is the fruit of the Spirit, but it is something that must be nurtured. We must we must surrender our hearts to God and let him mold and fashion us. And sometimes what the Lord will do, he will allow people to step on our toe. <laughs> and when people step on our toe, we will get an idea of how much progress we are making or how much we have not made. <laughs> when people step on our toe, we will know how much progress we have made. We will know how much progress we have not made. And we will say, Lord, have mercy upon me. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Give me patience, Lord. Give me self-control. Give me kindness. Give me long-suffering. That is the prayer we need to pray if we're going to grow as Christians, if we're going to become mature Christians. And to claim that we are growing in Jesus. Amen. So tonight we learn that the measuring stick. The measuring stick. Of our Christianity. Of our behavior. Is the love of God. And our Christianity is measured by three main things. Our character. Which is measured by love. Our faith. Which I'll talk about tomorrow night. And our understanding which I'll talk about on Wednesday night. Tonight, we're saying, if you want to know if you're a true Christian, look at your behavior. Look at how you practice the truth in your lives. Look at how much you love and care for other people. And by the grace of God, this church, my brothers and sisters, when filled with the Spirit of God, yes, we receive the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel. We receive the Holy Spirit to understand the word, but mainly, we receive the Holy Spirit to help us to reflect more of the character of Christ. May God help us to possess this love. That rather than being sounding brass and clanging cymbal, we can be genuine Christians.